Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here with part one of a six part series on how to program for resistance training. Now, all of this information comes from chapter 17 of the textbook, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, put out by the NSCA. Now, in part one, we'll talk about how to conduct a needs analysis for your athletes and the sport that they compete in, and why this is so important as the groundwork for your program that you will soon develop. Now, all the parts for this mini series are linked down below in the description, and you can also watch through to the end so that you can click through to part two of the video. Okay guys, let's dive right into the material. Now this information comes from chapter 17 of the book Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, and this chapter was written by Drs. Shepard and Triplett. Now when we are designing a resistance training program, we always need to follow these seven steps. Now the NSCA puts them in this order it doesn't necessarily have to be in this order, although this is definitely a good place to start if you are new to programming resistance training. All right, and in this video, in particular, we are covering the needs analysis. How do we know what our athlete needs? How do we determine that? And how does that influence our programming? Now, the needs analysis is a two-stage process. We first need to evaluate the requirements and characteristics of the sport, and then we need to assess the athlete. Now it's really important that you go through both of these steps because if you only evaluate the sport but not the athlete, then you'll probably miss some key components to either what brought that athlete to the current level of competition, right? Their health history, their training history, their uh, resistance training history, key physical or psychological or physiological parameters of that athlete, potential injury status of that athlete, or you might miss some of the key components of the sport. Maybe you assess everything you can about the athlete. You get their height and their weight and their wingspan and their maximum strength and their power and their jump height and their sprint times and you under and, and their training history, but perhaps you have forgotten about, but perhaps you're missing some key components of the sport that they need to be prepared for. So we always need to assess the sport and assess the athlete when we are uh, creating a needs analysis. Now, in the evaluation of the sport, uh, there are three primary components, and then, of course, a lot of little subcomponents that fall under each of these. So the first would be a movement analysis of the sport. So in a movement analysis, we need to look at body and limb movement patterns and muscular involvement. So if you are working with a track and field athlete, are they a thrower? Are they a jumper? Are they a sprinter? If they're a sprinter, what type of sprinter are they? Are they a short sprinter or a long sprinter? If you're working with a team sport athlete, uh, what's a, what sport is it? Is it soccer, basketball, uh, volleyball, field hockey? And B, what position does this athlete play in that sport? If it's soccer, are they a forward or, or they are a defender? Are they a midfielder? Are they the goalie? All of these things will impose different movement demands on the athlete, and we need to critically evaluate those. So does this athlete frequently accelerate and decelerate, or do they tend to hold a constant velocity during the race? Do they have to make sharp turns and cuts? Do they take hits? Do they have to exert their own force against an opponent? Or are they only dealing with an implement or an object? The next step is a physiological analysis. So what are the strength, power, hypertrophy, and muscular endurance priorities in this sport? Of course, if it's an endurance sport, then of course endurance will be the priority. And if it's a strength sport, then strength will be the priority. But what about everything in between? It's easy if you're working with a power lifter to know that, okay, strength is the number one priority or a distance runner, it's easy to know that, hey, uh, aerobic endurance is probably the number one priority. But how do you get more nuanced than that? The most simple example is comparing a power lifter to an endurance athlete. A power lifter will obviously prioritize strength over any type of endurance, while a distance athlete or endurance athlete will obviously prioritize forms of aerobic endurance over strength. However, it becomes much more nuanced when you're designing a training program for this athlete, because let's say with that distance runner, you still need to work in some strength stimulus for injury prevention and to increase their rate of force development uh, during the ground contact time of their foot strike to improve their stride, uh, to help them to accelerate maybe at the end of the race. And for that power lifter, no, they don't need any aerobic component in competition, but they do need to be able to recover from hard training, not only from hard training sessions, but even within the session to be able to recover from hard set to the next hard set. And so we need a more nuanced analysis and furthermore, if you take team sports, it gets muddy really quickly because let's go back to that example of a soccer player. These athletes require high levels of endurance, but they also 
essentially just sprint all over the field. It's just a, a game of repeated sprints where you also kick the ball and occasionally score, right? And so how do we balance these demands. It's important to quantify them and to figure out what do we prioritize, not only for this athlete, for the sport, but also for the period of the season that they're in. And then finally, we need an injury analysis. So what are the common joints and muscles and sites of injury, not only for the sport, but also in this athlete's history? Okay, part two is the assessment of the athlete. So we assess the sport. Now, what about this particular athlete? First of all, what is their training status? What is the type of program that they have been on or are currently in? This might mean a conversation with their head coach, or at the very least, a look into this athlete's training log, or at least talking to them one-on-one uh, -on -one so you can get a, a good picture of what is the weekly, uh, monthly, and down to even the day, what's the daily schedule, training schedule for this athlete. Are there two days that we have to deal with? Do they take Saturday off, or is Thursday off, or is Sunday their day off? How intensely do they train? Do sessions last for 45 minutes or 90 minutes or 120 minutes? All of these things need to be taken into account so that A, you're not overworking the athlete, and so that B, you can optimize the stimulus that you're providing in the weight room for this athlete. We also want to consider whether or not this athlete has been involved in a resistance training program. Is this their first time in the weight room? Or they have, have they been a trainee for the previous 10 years and they can already squat double body weight and they're familiar with the Olympic lifts? What's really interesting is that even at the elite levels, we often see athletes who have markedly different training styles and training history, especially when it comes to resistance training um, and resistance training technique. So according to the NSA, uh, this table classifies, it's one example of classifying resistance training status, and it separates out beginners, intermediate, and advanced trainees. So a beginner trainee would be anyone with less than two months of training in the weight room, right? They might've been training for their sport for 10 years, but just uh, less than two months in the weight room. And this athlete could get away with training as little as one to two times per week with low training stress, or maybe they have none, they currently have none, and they're going to progress into low training stress. And they currently possess no or minimal uh, technique or skill. Now an intermediate athlete will have been training for less than a year, right? Up to six months. And they can train up to two to three days a week. And now we want to progress the training stress in the weight room, at least to medium, right? We need to continue to prevent an overload. And they may have basic skill. Maybe they can do a basic squat, a basic hip hinge, a basic press, and a basic pulling movement pattern. But perhaps they lack the skill to perform something more complex like a power clean or a snatch. And then finally, our advanced trainees have over a year of training they can handle up to three to four times per week of training. And remember, we're talking about athletes who also have other practice aside from just the resistance training that you're giving them. And they can handle a higher training stress. And for them to be an advanced trainee, we will have observed a high uh, degree of experience and technique. Now, these numbers, of course, won't fit all athletes. Um, I've seen plenty of athletes who maybe have three or four years of you know, training experience or weight training experience and they just haven't put in the time or the dedication that it takes to really master even some of the basic movements. Or perhaps they were coached incorrectly or not coached at all. And as is often the case, unfortunately, in some high school programs that may not have a qualified strength coach. And so you get athletes at the collegiate level often, and you are having to correct all kinds of technique errors and uh, you know, mistakes that, have, that will you know, seriously set this athlete back or at the very worst, potentially injure that athlete. And so although someone may have, you know, over four years of uh, resistance training experience, their technique and their movement patterns may be that of a novice trainee. So we always have to be careful. We can't assume just based on the uh, amount of training age that an athlete has that they fall into the intermediate or advanced categories. Now, another key component of the needs analysis is physical testing and evaluation. We need to test the athlete's abilities, not just in the sport, but in parameters directly related to the sport. How strong is the athlete? How powerful is the athlete? How fast can this athlete accelerate? All these things are important. Now the tests should all relate directly to the athlete's sport and we can use the results of the movement analysis to select the tests. So when you are analyzing the sport, let's again say it's a soccer athlete and you notice that this athlete is a midfielder, he or she has to change directions frequently, he or she is running constantly during the game up and down the field, and they need to be able to occasionally accelerate very quickly um, in order to run down the forwards from the opposing team. And so that would determine then the tests that you give this athlete. Maybe you give this athlete um, a yo-yo level two test for 
anaerobic uh, capacity. Maybe you do also a yo-yo level one for aerobic capacity, and you do a vertical jump for an assessment of lower body power. We can then take these results and compare them to normative data, either found in the literature, found in the NSCA's textbook, um, or that has been published online, or that we've been gathering over the years as diligent coaches or sports scientists, and compare them to see how this athlete stacks up against previous athletes that we've had, or athletes from other clubs or from other teams. And then from these tests, we can determine a primary resistance training goal. Maybe this athlete has awesome stamina, really good endurance. They scored very highly on the yo-yo level one uh, intermittent recovery test, but perhaps their vertical jump is low. Maybe if you tested their back squat or tested them on an isometric mid-thigh pull, perhaps they pulled you know, very low numbers. And so these things would dictate how you then train them in the, in the weight room. Maybe maximal strength needs to be the goal for a while until you get this athlete up to a level where they have a strength reserve and then we can start training power. Or let's say, on the other hand, perhaps this athlete can back squat double body weight. Uh, maybe they are able to you know, pull a lot on isometric mid-thigh pull, but they're not quite translating that into usable force, right? They don't quite have the rate of force development to turn it into a high vertical jump. And so they're, they're actually not very quick based on how strong they are. So maybe now we need to incorporate more power training, some more plyometrics or the use of Olympic lifts or their derivatives. And this is how we can use testing uh, which is part of the assessment of the athlete, in order to drive the programming of our resistance training. Now, we also want to consider uh, what season we are in when considering resistance training priorities. In general, and again, this is in general because it might differ based on the needs of your athlete or your sport, but in general, the off-season is going to be the best time to develop hypertrophy and muscular endurance. Initially, because we need a high volume of high mechanical tension loading in order to encourage hypertrophy and muscular endurance. And it's a very fatiguing way to train, right? Five sets of 10 on the back squat is, you know, that's gonna get you super sore, right? You're not gonna be able to sit down or really walk down a flight of stairs after you do that. But that might be what it takes for some of our more advanced trainees to continue putting on muscle mass. And we're not exactly going to want to train these athletes in season that way. A, because it will decrease performance and the coach will get mad at you, and B, because it uh, puts them at risk of injury. So that's best done in the early off season, and then we can start developing strength and then even touch on power later in the off season. As we get into the preseason and the sport practice tends to increase in priority, resistance training uh, priority decreases slightly, and we start to incorporate sport specific movements, right? So maybe now instead of just back squatting, maybe we're also doing some unilateral work because we're working with an athlete who needs to cut or um, often sprints, right? Which is, which is a, a one leg at a time type of uh, ballistic or plyometric movement. And so we start incorporating some things that are more similar to the movement analysis that we made for the sport. As we get into the in-season, resistance training priority becomes low in most team sports, at least, as sport practice uh, becomes much higher in priority. Now we often want to switch over to a maintenance role uh, in, in the weight room. So we're just trying to maintain the strength and power that we've already developed. Or sometimes if, you, a, um, if you're a good coach and you, and you can really work with the sport coach on taking advantage of times where there aren't as many competitions or maybe where you have a slight lull in practice, you can really take advantage and, and possibly increase the uh, strength and power of these athletes in season. It's been done and it's been shown in the literature, uh, but oftentimes I know coaches do revert back just to a maintenance phase to really get those athletes through the season and allow them to focus all of their energy and recoverability on sport practice and on competition. And now in the postseason, um, it, it can be variable. It depends from sport to sport and at different levels, right? High school will be different than college, will be different than uh, professional sport or post-collegiate sport. But oftentimes right after the season, we really want our athletes to engage in a period of active rest where we don't have a, a super focused resistance training or sport practice uh, goal or program for them. And maybe they just engage in some recreational weight training. A lot of athletes are just enjoy training. And so uh, perhaps some you know bodybuilding style training uh, of low intensity, of course, and, and relatively low volumes, or perhaps some more functional fitness type training uh, using movement patterns that they typically don't move. Getting away from more of the monotonous aspects of their training is good, A, physically, and B, psychologically. And so guys, that wraps up the needs analysis that we need to conduct before we start programming for resistance training for any athlete that we're working with. Remember, there's two parts to it. A, the analysis of the sport, and then B, the analysis of the athlete. 
So the next step in this process is exercise selection. And I have a video about that that you can click on, which will appear somewhere here on the screen. If you have any questions about this video, though, let me know down in the comments and I'll engage with you there. Thanks guys for watching this video and I'll see you on the next video.